Lantern structure if if there is a adverse if there's an adversarial relationship and, and I don't mean hostile relationship but if management or board holds the power in the organization you know you're uh, you're not you're unlikely to be able to change it go in and say we want to restructure now there could be other unique I don't know what your organization is there could be other unique situations where you know there's an entry point there where you could uh, you know uh, have a more um, positive uh, you know process for, for changing things where your, your job is not threatened you know, ask yourself whether you might you're afraid of getting fired um, in this process, and that tells you something about whether you need a union or whether you can change the organization as a as a structure. Um, I mean, I think it's really significant to be having this kind of conversation now, and I think it's very important that at least for Andy and I sitting up here as directors of institutions, we're talking about. Um, implementing these kinds of leadership styles um, and asking other leaders who are in this room and other people who want to be joining this conversation to really be thinking about um, what we're modeling in the kinds of structures that we're building and the ways that we're supporting or not supporting our staff. Um, so I think part of it is a leadership question, um, Naomi, and I also think that um, one question that I bring to myself all the time is about the scale of our work. Right? So if there's only enough money to pay employees, um, if, if, if my base at, at PFP is full-time 50000 there's an, that's what there is to pay employees. How, how much does that calculate out per hour? It's not okay for anybody on my staff, to, or it's not okay for me to ask my staff to work more than 35 hours a week at that rate. And if my staff can't get that work done, then they're doing too much work. And we need to recognize that. And I think that um, as an institution, at least for me, the only thing I can do is so in, individuals can make different choices. And as workers, they can choose to do what they want. And not, that's, I'm not going to uh, you know, work on that part yet. Um, <laughs> but, but what I can do is set, that as, set an example. And I can also create an um, expectation um, that the work gets done within that time. Um, if, in terms of promotions, in terms of um, uh, advancement in any way, and one of the things we think about is how do we help people scale back as a way to gain promotion, right? So at that same salary, do you work a day less? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, the work has to be scaled that way, which means it has to be planned for in that way, which means the expectations of the production of the institution, whatever our measures of success are, our measures of impact, need to shift. And so it's very intricate in planning, but as a leader, I'm completely committed to that. Um, another, yeah, you asked a lot of different parts, so another thing I just I'm wanted sorry, to just respond to, no, it's great, um, is about board. Um, for me, one of the ways that I tried to make change on our board um, had to do with, and Andy mentioned this too, is having the staff have relationships with our board members. And um, not only so that the board members see the staff mem members as part of the institution and as individual um, that they develop relationships to our programming and to our people in that kind of way. So really having um, the staff have a critical role on the board. One of the like simple and playful ways that I've done that is ask the um, staff member to come to a board meeting and just say, what, you know, what's something wonderful that, by your own measure that you were able to complete this uh, quarter as a staff member of the folklore project? and then use that as a beginning of a conversation for the staff member creatively. And one staff member led the board through a, a Cambodian line dance, you know, and then we had a discussion about something completely different from that, you know, just to let that, then use that as a, a way to introduce themselves and their um, values to the board as well. And I think that that's also helped to create a relationship between the board and what's happening on the staff. Just some responses. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> What you said regarding, I mean, I, I haven't thought about it this way, but what you said about you know, sort of making a point and standing as an example I think is, for other people is real key. Because, I mean, what Selena pointed out earlier is that they were, we took advantage of transitions at our institutions, and we were, we were the kind of people who, who wanted to share power. I mean, you know, that, that's really what it came down to. So we got, we were in 
inclined in a certain way, I had an opportunity to, to, to execute something. And I don't, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if it weren't for that, I, I, I might not be working in the club center anymore. You know, I don't know what I'd be doing, but yeah. um, the board issue is an interesting one, and that, that has a lot to do, it's, it's a related component, you know. Um, we have been thoughtful when building the board to find people who share the values of the organization. You know, often with nonprofits, the inclination is to say, we need someone who has money. We need a lawyer. We need this. We need that. And, you know, I mean, fundamentally, my attitude toward board development from the staff side has been, we need people who, if they don't get what we do, are on the same page ethically and morally and even politically, you know, um, because that's the key to making the organization work. Um, you know, that assumption of we bring we, something, I, I, I just got to rant for a minute. You know, but this notion that boards are there primarily to raise money and that you need to have wealthy people on the board fundamentally, often what you get are self-important people who, are on, who believe that they, they who have an out, out size sense of who they are and their value because they're asked to join boards because they're rich. You know, and then they start to make absurd suggestions and, and throw their weight around, around ideas that you're like, a, 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 yeah. so we've been real lucky, I think, um, with how the board was developed under the previous director and also how we've been able to assist in board development now, um, you know, and I still don't think they get what we're up to, but we're better off than we have been. There's one sort of structure that I would go back to, like the, this idea, like, are you afraid of being fired, or really speaks to, like, do you need a union? Like, um, we, we haven't talked about, because so, sometimes there is, especially in large organizations, like a real adversarial, you have to have an adversarial relationship, or, um, and then you can move into more creative relationships that I think, uh, interestingly, re re uh, revolve around the ability for the staff to take responsibility for the running of the organization and for the financial health of the organization. But so you could see a, um, if you were willing to do that and move from adversarial, like take an adversarial stance and then move into more sort of co-creative stances, and then you could see, I mean, there's, there's no reason you can't start a union and make one of your contract demands, like one or two or three seats on the board for the employees. It's an entirely, like, I think traditional unionism has steered away from the idea that we're going to really like engage with management in like a real conversation about what's necessary and how we can all make this organization work well together. And the other structure for doing that that has been relatively well explored is like a labor management committee where it's not the board but where like the union and labor sits down with the managers and says like so we've got this problem, uh, how do we solve it? And that might happen. It might mean like suspending the contract for this or suspending like X, Y, Z paragraphs of the contract for this one division so that we can solve this problem together. But you can have this like sort of co-creative conversation that like has worked well in some places and then, but you have to put real effort into it. And if, if it doesn't, if you don't put real effort into it and trust each other, uh, they, they tend to weather or go badly. I don't know if I have so much of a question, but just some reflections. And this conversation has been really fascinating to bring up. Um, I'm a, well, a folk artist. I've worked for over two decades in different levels of organizations, both folk arts and um, arts organizations that have a folk, <coughs> folk arts program, specifically one of folk arts. So it's a very different situation. But um, I um, you know, was reflecting at how every organization in society, but certainly uh, uh, nonprofits have their culture, internal culture that is developed inside them. And the, I, I've worked under hierarchical ones <coughs> all my life and, um, and thought often about this question. The hierarchy establishes a whole series of, of parameters about what kinds of things are discussed and what are never discussed, uh, what the staff meeting looks like. Um, you know, is it just an affirmation of the existing hierarchy or is it actually an opportunity to discuss anything meaningful. I mean, how do we achieve the mission of the organization? Um, 
So it's, uh, it's a real challenge. Um, I appreciate very much what you were saying about what is democracy. And my question at the end of this would be the term democratization, sort of uh, what each of you um, take it to mean. Um, I mean, I think it's sort of an interesting word that it's a verb you know, made out of a noun. Uh, and um, you know, to what degree is democracy something that you um, actively create or impose versus the, the people, whatever the demos is, demands, which is the model of the uh, unionization. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the question. And the other part is um, I'm a board member of the uh, New York Focus Society under whose auspices this event is happening. And I just want to make a little plug that um, it is a um, traditionally from its founding a membership organization. And on the board, we've been struggling for a couple of years with the question of uh, what does that mean for it to be a membership organization? And can it go survive doing that um, with a membership that is much, much smaller than it was originally? Uh, partly because, well, because the idea of membership has changed in itself. Uh, but one of the roles that the Focus Society can do in, in the context of this discussion is to uh, revive or aspire to its role or its mission as an advocate for the field, both for folklorists and folk artists, um, to share information about the realities of what it is to work in the field, um, to advocate in whatever way, I don't know what exactly that form it will take to that folklorists be treated more fairly or be feel a sense of empowerment. I'm really impressed with what you've been able to do in terms of uh, reshaping your organizations to be more inclusive. Uh, we need to hear more about that. So. Um, oh, and so any of you who aren't members of the Focus Society, I hope you join us. <laughs> um, and at our next annual meeting, which is on April 2nd, we are having a business meeting where this very question will be discussed, and we need you know, members to come forward and, and speak for themselves and talk about what they want to see. Um, and uh, I you know, personally favor a more inclusive uh, structure and one where there is an opportunity for members to, to have their voices heard. Um, I mean, you know, through an actual balloting when decisions have to be made and so forth, but we need to hear from the members. So. I feel like what people, what's always struck me about worker cooperatives is the extent to which actual democracy just does not feel that good or that interesting. Uh, which is, where like an actual democracy you know, is in the sense is like that sort of that ability to vote every you know year, every four years, uh, and hold people accountable through that mechanism. Like it's it's not that interesting. Uh, what people really want is they either are excited by the prospect of democratizing wealth, uh, or they're excited by the, democ the, po the possibility of creating meaningful participation. So when I think about like, oh, what would be interesting and meaningful participation is both like the opportunity to have your voice heard, um, but also see that it has like real outcomes. And so not just be like, what happened? went to a meeting and had a conversation. Right? Like you went to a meeting, you had a conversation, it like opened up a conversation and then narrowed down where you got to like, oh, we're gonna move forward with some things that maybe not be all the things I want, or some of the things I wanted. Um, and so I, I would in some ways encourage uh, the uh, if you're looking at larger building larger membership and participation, to not necessarily say, oh, we want to, um, we want to like more votes, but maybe maybe it's a, and so maybe organizational resources, resources could go to more participation in like what do people want to see and what's meaningful, and then making sure that they're well facilitated conversations that have meaningful outcomes. Um, okay. Can I say that I think in any discussion of democracy, you also have to be talking. You have to be doing a power analysis too, because you know we are often in situations where um, we can talk about being uh, having a very uh, trying to have the best um, interactions and the most inclusive and the most democratic interactions in very small arenas where to begin with we have very little power. Like, I was very struck by your comment about the $50,000. You're trying to run this, you're trying to ha have this organization be as just and as democratic as possible. But the reality is, your organization is starved for resources. 
And so that democracy is everybody getting 50,000 bucks, which is a shitty salary to live on, even in Philadelphia, uh, which is a little bit cheaper than living in New York. I mean, but that's ridiculous. Your organization is starved for resources. And so there has to be that analysis that, um, you know, uh, we are, we need to be able to impact the power that is starving your organization, you know, for resources, so. Wow. And just a slightly different tact, but kind of thinking about your question about what does democratization mean to each of us. Um, I find it a word that you, that, it's not a word I use, it's a word that um, holds very little meaning for me. I feel like it means one person, one vote, and that feels really superficial. Um, the word that I would use instead would be more partnership. Um, and to me, that has a lot more power. And it, and I like your characterization of uh, partic uh, participation and you know a greater engagement as also being a part of that. So you know that what I'm looking for is not how can we create more opportunities for voting, but uh, you know in, in this kind of conversation, but more opportunities for feeling like you're. Um, a full kind of partner in, in doing this work is more the word that I look at. Yeah, I, I, until I saw the title of this event, I never used the word democratization to describe. I mean, it made sense. Um, I don't think I thought about it a lot. You know, so in our case, it sort of means. I guess I'm mean, trying to find a way to characterize it, and unfortunately, the, the dead, dead Kennedy song is what comes to mind, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but the idea here that, that, that freedom is, we're talking about freedom, you know, to act within the confines of our organization, and that responsibility goes hand in hand with that freedom, you know, so that everybody has a stake in the things that make the organization function. And uh, unfortunately, I tend to think in apocalyptic terms too. To keep it from breaking down and falling apart, right? I mean, so that's where my head goes. But I think you know, you know um, when I'm not stuck in my kind of adolescent science fiction imagination, like I mean, I would, I, I think what you said was really insightful because I, I think that's when things work for us, we are being respectful partners to one another. But when they don't work, we're not. And I think that's a fairly cut and dry way to look at it for us. <laughs> I, I just wanted to gloss something a little bit uh, in terms of uh, Maya's com you know, comment that uh, you know, a certain level salary around 50000 is not so great. And uh, I, I just want to acknowledge that. I, I know that you know, here in New York State and many other places in the country, that that would definitely be considered the top of the scale in the work that we do. And I think there's a, a direct relationship between that parameter and um, and, and certainly the salaries that fall, uh, you know, lower than that median, median, and um, and the issue of diversity in the leadership in our field, and um, you know when you were talking about the, the possibility of you know people getting together and, and engaging in collective bargaining or you know moving towards some kind of unionization process, well you would have to draw upon the talent in the field and so on. I have to have to gather all these people together. And I, I just want to put a, a shout out to um, an amazing resource that has developed nationally and started with my colleague, Keisha Johnson, at um, the Center for Traditional Music and Dance. Over the last several years, she's built an enormous, enormous cohort of women of color in the arts. The organization is now called Women of Color in the Arts. And one of the issues that they're working on is the issue of equity, um, you know, and, and the issue of, of sharing power. Uh, in, in the work that we do, and, and um, including people who are not necessarily included and, um, and also need to be paid in an equitable way. Um, so I, I just want to offer that to, to point out that those big collectives are out there. Um, there are conferences all over the country where people in the arts come together, and they may be working in a slightly different disciplinary perspective from ours. There's you know, the a Society for Ethnomusicology, there's American Folklore Society, American Anthropological Society, uh, Association, and then you know there are these arts administration um, movements, and I, 
you know, that it's a very fruitful way to think about uniting, um, because I think some of the issues are, are very much common, common ground. So um, I did want to just point out that we're getting, we're getting towards, I think, about 20 minutes to 8. And I, and I wondered if um, people wanted to use the mic to, to make some suggestions about where we go from here. Um, I think it would be nice if we had some kind of follow-up event um, at some point. Um, we are doing a, a Folk Arts Roundtable in New York State uh, in May that's going to be centered on the theme of social justice, and maybe that's one way to continue the conversation. Um, we could also, you know, just use the existing structure that we started with, with these different perspectives, you know, um, kind of reforming best practices within nonprofits, um, the, the worker cooperative angle and what we can learn from the many varieties of structures in, in that whole field, and also looking at unionization and, you know, potentially just assemble into working groups along those lines. But I don't want to graft all, you know, this onto um, the people we have here, I'd like to hear from people directly what people would like to do. Well, without making a direct suggestion, I want to say that I think that one of the most important ways of moving forward is for existing organizations to support change as it happens within organizations. So, that as you restructure, that other organizations looking in, like the New York Folklore Society, if they can support you in any of that. Um, because one of the things I found working in arts and culture is that as you try to innovate um, structure or, or programming or anything that you come up against larger, often larger established organizations that have huge amounts of resistance to change. And so, if we can support um, support the organizations that are starting to, to find ways to change, then that is the best way to motivate more change. And, and I think that's incredibly important. And you know, as somebody who's battled with boards and <laughs> of various sizes, <coughs> there's nothing like support from your peers and your colleagues. And, yeah, and I would I, I add something to that, which is sort of where Lisa started, which is this idea of um, working to reframe what we mean by leadership in the context of our field. I mean, that to me is, is the crucial bit. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how we do that. I, I leave that to Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, that, that I think that's part of the question, though, too. I mean, we found a profoundly powerful um, it was profoundly powerful to work together in this working group um, because of the kinds of questions we were asking and the work that we were doing. But at the same time, it was hard to make it visible. So like, I'm thinking about what you were just saying, and it's been hard for us to report back on it effectively because it was so, um, and so much of this work feels really personal, um, maybe a little uh, idiosyncratic to each of our organizations, our personal work stories, where we're at. Um, but at the same time, and we don't want to say, this is what you should do, you know, because that feels just as yucky as, you know, some of this other stuff. So how do we, um, how do we better share? How do we better make visible? How do we share models? Um, how do we kind of keep this a dynamic, kind of open conversation, um, embracing new models of leadership? I mean, those are some of the questions that I have. And how do we continue to embrace people outside our field who have perspectives on this sort of thing, like yeah. you guys? I mean, it's been great hearing new voices. How do you do that? Yeah, So I, I just want, I'm Ellen McHale at the New York Folklore Society, and I just wanted to say that we um, did receive support for this from the American Folklore Society, and there's going to be um, a public report on what was said. So back to your question about you know getting the word out, we, it will be posted on the American Vocal Society website, the proceedings from today. Not immediately, but <laughs> well, anyway, to add to that, I mean that it, I mean the AF, what's the what's the category? Professional development consulting. Yeah that's what I mean, yeah that supported this. It supported our initial meeting. It supported right. all of the work all that I've done this. And it supported what we've done. So, and there are reports on their website about all of the process that we've gone through there. And there will be a report from the Vermont Folk Arts Center, actually. Hi, I'm Victor 
Mr. Wilson, I just have a small comment, which is I think if you want to make this kind of a meeting productive, you should take advantage of your own experience, which was small groups talking ideas together. Because in a meeting like this, I'm sitting, I have all sorts of thoughts, but I really can't express them. But talking to Chris and someone else, in 10 seconds we exchange some interesting views. So that's what I would suggest. And I think in, in almost every area, like adequate resources at this point like, exist. It sounds like there's sort of interest uh, institutionally, and then there's this a pretty broad network of sort of people thinking about building democracy and participation um, almost everywhere. Uh, and it, I, would, I can't say enough about Aorta. I think I'll join everyone else in endorsing them as a organizational <laughs> resource. Um, and additionally, uh, I'll just say the Democracy at Work Institute is a great resource if you're interested in building worker cooperative uh, structures. And then, but I do think the one, the thing that I does sort of that idea that democratization has to be happening inter inside of organizations, but also like in our broader economy. Uh, and I think that's, that maybe is the area to me for future inquiry because, or more inquiry, and I don't think it's a working group or anything, but you know, because it's, like our economy is so deeply broken and it won't, uh, it won't fix itself through the political process at this point. We have to draw on like the folk and the folk resources, and it's, it's just striking to me how often the folk own and control resources that we don't use effectively. Um, you know, this building is in many ways controlled by the arts organizations, and it's not used uh, in any way that's like political, which seems like, odd to say that it should be, but it, it's worth thinking about like how buildings like this, like the um, at Society for Ethical Culture that owns a huge building up on Central Park, how do those types of resources, how does uh, the, the amalgamated bank, right, which the unions own, literally like in New York City, the unions own an intense amount of resources, huge amounts of money in benefit funds, and a whole bank all for them. Um, and it's amazing, how do we build, a, 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 how do we bring more resources into this economy, into the folk arts economy, into the arts economy, um, in ways that are rewarding to all sort of involved economically. Uh, but also that are start to shift the available funding. And maybe the, the question I didn't ask earlier that I wanted to hear about was if people do any funder education around Dumont. Like, because that's the other way we can shift resources so we can say, oh, like, it's easier to democratize things and have a more fair workplace when your funders demand that it's a fair workplace. Um, and so doing funder education, I just want to wonder if anyone's yeah. done that. Or when your board does. I mean, our our, our board chair is very active in a Vermont organization called Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. So we can go to the table with her and say, we think it's important for part-time people to have access to at least proportional paid time off. And she'll say, great. You know, so that, I mean, and that's part of board, that's, that's board management. That's creating a board that works. institution that is unlike the ones that you have described. Um, but uh, we represent workers at the New York Historical Society, uh, the people who work in the visitor services and the stores and the librarians and the archivists who are there. Um, we've been unionized there for many years, uh, almost 50 years. And um, we are in a huge struggle with them over getting a fair contract. The wages are really low. And I kudos to you, Selena, for that 50,000 in your small organization because we are trying to establish a minimum of $50,000 for the librarians and the archivists at the New York Historical Society, a much bigger organization with a very wealthy board and many, many millions and hundreds of billions of dollars in, in resources. So it's a, a stark contrast to what you guys are doing. Um, and the, the society's been incredibly cheap. Um, at the same time, their typical hypocrisy, they are cloaking themselves in the mantle of um, progressivism 
uh, they're opening a women's center, a women's history center in the next couple of years, and they have all these lead up events. And so next weekend, they have a conference scheduled um, called Sweat Equity <laughs> about uh, women uh, workers in the garment center, and they have uh, many people speaking who are people who work for unions and you know, progressive <laughs> academics, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so we have set a strike deadline um, for uh, Friday, March 4th, for a three-day strike for the 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, we expect that that conference would not be able to go forward because there are so many people who would just not cross a picket line. Um, they may leave us out there, though, and refuse to settle the contract, and um, we have to go on strike. So just wanted to do a commercial for our picket lines at the New York Historical Society next weekend. They will be fun picket lines and good picket lines and many good uh, comrades to talk to. So had to since we were at this event, I had to do that commercial. Thanks. kind of an organic stopping point. <laughs> um, I would like to just uh, um, suggest that somehow we stay in contact with each other to figure out what the next steps are and that I, I, I don't think I'm speaking uh, um, inaccurately for folks to say that I think there's a commitment here to some of these issues and that we want to keep talking about them, if not find a way to, to act on them. So um, with just another thank you to the New York Folklore Society for uh, <laughs> and another thank you to the American Folklore Society for supporting us. <laughs> for those who are tuning in to this video, which is going to appear on nyfolklore.org um, fairly shortly, um, we encourage uh, an ongoing national conversation, and uh, com comments can be um, posted to the event page, or we'll find other ways to, uh, to tweet them and, and to get them around on social media so that when we have another event, uh, the word will be out there and we can keep uh, the conversation and the action going. So thank you all for attending, and thank you to our <laughs>